Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, see everyone here. My name is Greg Ball. I'm the Dean of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences here at the University of Maryland. And I'm very pleased to introduce today's Sadat Forum, which um, is marking the 40th anniversary of the Camp David Accords, one of the most important diplomatic events um, in recent history. Um, I'd like to start uh, by introducing the president of the University of Maryland College Park, Professor Wallace Love. Thank you, Dean Ball, for your leadership of Vsauce. And welcome, everyone, to the 2018 Sadat Forum. And it happens to occur on the 40th anniversary of the Camp David Accords. The distinguished panelists will be introduced shortly. Let me simply indicate that it was shortly after that historic accord that the Sadat Chair for Peace and Development was established. It was established to honor the courage and the vision of President Sadat, which, as you may know, he and Prime Minister Begin of Israel went on to receive the Nobel Prize. But for his courage and his vision, President Sadat gave his life. So today, we also recognize and honor the incredible work of the Sadat Chair for Peace and Development that is occupied by Professor Shibli Dalhamid. And he has brought distinguished people to further the mission of that chair. And that mission is to continue the dialogue to bring peace to the Middle East. So at a time of incredible partisanship and passion and rancor. What Professor Telhami brings is a passion for facts, for truth, for peace, and for reason. Thank you all for being here tonight. Before I present the messages from President Jimmy Carter and Dr. Jahan Sadat, I would like to briefly introduce our panelists. I'll start with Ambassador Daniel Kurtzer. Daniel C. Kurtzer received his PhD from Columbia University, and at present he is the S. Daniel Abraham Professor of Middle East Policy Studies at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. He took this appointment following a 29-year career in the U.S. Foreign Service. He retired in 2005 with the rank of career minister. From 2001 to 2005, he was the United States ambassador to Israel. And from 1997 to 2001, he was the United States ambassador to Egypt. He served as a political officer at the American embassies in Cairo and Tel Aviv, deputy director of the Office of Egyptian Affairs, and deputy assistant secretary of state for Near Eastern Affairs. Throughout his career, he's been instrumental in formulating and executing U.S. policy toward the Middle East peace process, and he remains active in track two diplomacy related to the Middle East. <clears throat> Quite interestingly, in 2007, he was named the first commissioner of the Professional Israel Baseball League. <laughs> he is co-author of books such as Negotiating the Arab-Israeli Peace, American Leadership in the Middle East, co-author of The Peace Puzzle, America's Quest for Arab-Israeli Peace, 1989-2001, 2011, excuse me, and editor of Pathways to Peace, America and the Arab-Israeli Conflict. Welcome, Ambassador Kurtzer. Professor Ellen Leipson, she received her bachelor's degree from Cornell and her master's from the School of Advanced International Study at Johns Hopkins here in nearby DC. At present, she is director of the Master's of International Security degree program and the Center for Security Policy Studies at the Shah School of Policy and Government at George Mason. Professor Leibson joined George Mason after a distinguished 25-year career in government and as president and CEO of the Stimson Center from 2002 to 2015. She serves on a number of academic and other non-governmental boards related to international security and diplomacy, and is a weekly columnist for worldpoliticsreview.com. Her last post in government 
was vice chair of the National Intelligence Council, a position she held till 2002. She's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, and she serves on advisory councils of a number of groups, such as Georgetown University's Institute for Advanced Study and Diplomacy. She was a member of the CIA External Advisory Panel, President Obama's Intelligence Advisory Board, and the Secretary of State's Foreign Affairs Advisory Board from 2011 to 2014. Welcome, Professor Lake. Professor William Plonk, he received his bachelor's from Stanford, his PhD from MIT. From 1994 to 2013, he held the Edward R. Statinius Chair in the Department of Politics at the University of Virginia, where he taught courses on the Middle East and American foreign policy. In 2012, UVA gave him the university's Thomas Jefferson Award. He was a senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Studies Program at the Brookings Institution, where he conducted research on the Middle East, American policy toward the Arab-Israeli conflict, and energy policy. Before going to Brookings, Dr. Quant served as a staff member on the National Security Council. There, he was actively involved in the negotiations that led to the Camp David Accords and the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty. Dr. Quant was also an associate professor of political sciences at Penn and worked at the Rand Corporation. His books include Peace Process, American Diplomacy in the Arab-Israeli Conflict, uh, Between Ballots and Bullets, Algeria's Transition from Authoritarianism, Camp David, Peacemaking in Politics, Revolution and Political Leadership, Algeria, and most recently he co-authored Peace Puzzle, America's Quest for Arab-Israeli Peace. Finally, our own Professor Shibli Talhami. He received his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley, and, and as President Lowe mentioned, he's at present the Anwar Sadat Professor of Peace and Development in the Department of Government and Politics here at the University of Maryland. He is director of the University of Maryland's Critical Issues Poll and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He has advised every U.S. administration from George H.W. Bush's to Barack Obama's. His best-selling book, The Stakes, America and the Middle East, was selected by Foreign Affairs as one of the top five books on the Middle East in 2003. In addition to his scholarship, we are proud to have him as one of our leading professors. The University of Maryland Honors College ranked, made him a recipient of the 2014 Outstanding Faculty Award, and he was recently selected as a 2018-19 Distinguished Scholar Teacher here at UMD. And thank you for your leadership. Uh, okay, um, I would now uh, like to read uh, a letter President Jimmy Carter uh, provided on the occasion of this event marking the 40th anniversary of the Camp David Accords. On this day, 40 years ago, I brought together President Anwar Sadat of Egypt and Prime Minister Menachem Begin of Israel for peace talks at Camp David, Maryland. We and our advisors would spend 13 days in difficult and intense negotiations and would emerge with a framework for peace in the Middle East better known as the Camp David Accord. This required courage and sacrifice on the part of the signers, Begin and Sadat. It was a significant achievement for peace and changed the reality of the Middle East. I commend all of you who have gathered at the University of Maryland to commemorate this anniversary and further assess its meaning. Meaning, I am grateful to Professor Shibli Talhami, the occupant of the Sadat Chair for Peace and Development, for hosting this special conversation. Over the years, I have witnessed his contributions to scholarship and the quest for peace. He and my great friend, Dr. Jahan Sadat, hosted me at the university some years ago when I delivered the Anwar, Anwar Sadat Lecture for Peace. Before the Camp David Accords and the subsequent Treaty of Peace between Egypt and Israel, these two nations had fought four major wars in 30 years. Since then, despite significant changes of government in both countries, and multiple regional crises that have tested the relationship, the agreement of peace between the two countries has been honored and peace upheld. Countless lives have been saved, precisely because the accords were so central in anchoring a new political order, their contribution almost has come to be taken for granted. I must point out that our aspirations at Camp David were greater than what had been achieved. I admit a lingering disappointment, which I have expressed over the years. The Accords included both the bilateral understanding 
between Egypt and Israel and a framework for resolving, quote, the Palestinian problem in all its respects, in all its aspects. The latter encompassed achieving autonomy for the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, territories that were occupied by Israel after the 1967 war. While Israel and Egypt peace was essential, I always believed <clears throat> that the Palestinian issue was fundamental to achieving a comprehensive peace in the region <clears throat> and for Israel to survive as a democratic state. Many Israelis have shared my view, and Anwar Sadat always stressed this point, beginning with his historic speech at Israel's Knesset and also at Camp David. Sadat's life was taken before the objectives of the Accords could be fully achieved. I feel strongly that had Anwar Sadat's life not been cut short, we would be in a much better place today. At times, I have been optimistic that peace between the Israelis and Palestinians was within their grasp, but sadly, the situation today makes optimism very difficult. Israeli settlements in the West Bank have expanded substantially over the past four decades. Palestinians have fundamental differences among themselves, and Israel's democracy is increasingly undermined by the weight of occupation. When I first met Anwar Sadat, he was fond of saying that 99% of the cards were in the hands of the United States. He certainly exaggerated, but he was right that the United States had a significant role to play, not only as an influential superpower, but also as a strong supporter of Israel, which has, also has interests across the region. The United States had, and still has, an obligation driven by both strategic and moral imperatives to succeed we must be an honest broker and be guided by a sense of fairness and respect for human rights and international agreements and obligations. We must maintain credibility, not only with all sides of the conflict, but also with the broader international community whose support will ultimately be needed to anchor any historic peace agreement. I forget to say that the United States currently does not appear to be pursuing the role of an honest broker. I am pleased that you have assembled an outstanding panel to discuss the implications of the Camp David Accords for American foreign policy. Joining Professor Talhami are three scholars I respect who have engaged in Middle East policy making for the United States. William Quant, I know the best because he was an important member of my negotiating team at Camp David. He, Ellen Leipson, and Daniel Kurtzer served numerous presidents, both Republican and Democratic. They bring perspective and experience. I know you will have an illuminating conversation, and I look forward to reading the transcript. Excellent. We now have a video uh, from Dr. Uh, Jahan Sadat. Ladies and gentlemen, Greetings from Cairo, Egypt to you all. The community of the University of Maryland, my academic home for decades, its leadership, President Wallace Law, Dean Gregory Ball, the holder of the Anwar Sadat chair, Chibli Talhami, and the distinguished panelist, Professor William Quant, Ambassador Daniel Kurtzer, and Professor Ellen Lepus, Lepson. I remember the day 40 years ago when my husband, President Anwar Sadat, and Israeli Prime Minister Begin arrived at Camp David, Maryland, with the eyes of the whole world focused on the critical negotiations between Egypt and Israel, conducted with the essential mediation of my honorable friend, President Jimmy Carter. These negotiations became possible because President Sadat surprised the whole world by extending the hand of peace to end the cycle of war that had consumed both countries for three decades. So much was at stake. Failure would have likely ended the prospect of peace for the foreseeable future and could have generated more war and more suffering. President Sadat went to Israel with an open heart and open mind. He understood the risks and the possibilities 
and was prepared to go the extra mile to assure success, as long as it did not come at the expense of Egypt's core national interest. He was also aware of the personal risk, as he had confided in me. My husband loved his country and was prepared to die for its sake. He assem his assessment tragically and to me personally heartbreakingly proved well founded when his life was taken before he could complete his journey. The Camp David Accords and the subsequent Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty ended the cycle of devastating wars between the two countries. Egypt regained every inch of its territory that was occupied by, Israeli, by Israel in 1967, while Israel received assurance of peace. Remarkably, for four decades, every Egyptian and Israeli government has upheld the terms of the bilateral peace treaty, despite extraordinary regional and international upheavals. President Sadat's journey for a comprehensive peace in the Middle East ended when, in a moment of horror, his life was cut short. I have often reflected on what that journey might have looked like if President Sadat had the, op the opportunity to continue. One clue comes from what he said at the Israeli Knesset in his breaking through visit to Israel. He said, I have not come here for a separate agreement between Egypt and Israel. This is not part of my policy of Egypt, of the policy of Egypt. The problem is not that of Egypt and Israel. Any separate peace between Egypt and Israel will not bring permanent peace based on justice in the entire region. Rather, even if peace between all the confrontation states and Israel were achieved, in the absence of a just solution to the Palestinian problems, never will be there be that durable and just peace upon which the entire world insists today. Sadly, the second of the two framework agreement in the Camp David Accords dealing with the Palestinian uh, issue remains unfulfilled. Forty years later, Palestinian independence and ending Israeli occupation of the West Bank seem more remote. Region could not, as my husband had warned the decade, decades ago, real peace in the region could not come without a just solution in the Palestinian, with the Palestinian problem. Today, I am grateful that my dear friend, President Jimmy Carter, is sending his own message to this gathering. There is so much to ponder about how the accords impacted American foreign policy in the Middle East and continue to do so. You have assembled an, extra, an outstanding panel for what I am confident will be an enlightening conversation, which I hope will inspire those listening, especially students, to see the value in the pursuit of peace. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much to President Carter and Dr. Jehan Sadat for the messages. And welcome uh, to the University of Maryland. It's great to host you. I know you've been here before. Uh, and in fact, uh, at least some of you have participated in uh, Sadat forums over the years. Um, it's good to have you here again. And this is really a, a critical uh, moment in American policy toward the Middle East. So pondering uh, the last four decades after Camp David is, is something uh, that is uh, difficult to do, but, is, but really should be done. Uh, and I'm going to start with you, Bill, because you are, of all of us on the stage, 
you're the only one who was actually there at Camp David. Uh, to this day, exactly, September 5, 1978, just to drive away from here, about an hour drive from, from this campus in Camp David, Maryland. And not only were you there, you were a critical player. You were really Jimmy Carter's top advisor uh, on the Middle East. So what I'd like to ask you to do is to give us some context. Uh, the context is, uh, you know, we heard from President Carter, from Dr. Sadat, um, about how this ended the cycle of violence. Four decades, three decades, four wars, 48, 56, 67, 73, devastating wars uh, to both countries, but especially to Egypt. Israeli, uh, Israel still control Egyptian territories as well as Gaza, Jordanian territory, Syrian territory. Um, they had just fought five years before a devastating war in 73, oil embargo pressure uh, uh, on, on world economy. Uh, and Sadat did a breakthrough step in November 1977, less than a year before Camp David, that really uh, shocked everyone. It was not expected. It was something that was uh, extraordinary by any measure historically uh, for a, the president of Egypt, which had not recognized Israel, uh, to go to the Israeli Knesset and essentially extend the hand of peace. Uh, but between that moment and S September 5, 1978, everything was not particularly smooth. There were ups and downs, and there were uh, questions about whether, in fact, uh, Sadat's initiative was going to bear fruit. And so tell us a little bit about how Jimmy Carter came to host this summit uh, and uh, what were the expectations? What did you do when you were preparing? Uh, the expectation of success and failure, the preparation for it, uh, uh, the, the, the environment as uh, uh, the delegations arrived on a day like today, in, uh, 40 years ago. Well, it uh, is a memorable uh, moment, 40 years after Camp David, and I, I remember quite vividly uh, the lead up to it, and of course those 13 days. I think it's important for people today to understand that this agreement that was a big historic achievement was not a foregone conclusion in September when we convened there. We had been through a very rocky period after Sadat's visit to Jerusalem in November. Uh, the subsequent attempts at negotiation which had largely taken place at the foreign minister level, had really not gone very well. Uh, Sadat at one point withdrew his delegation from negotiations. And in February of 1978, there had actually been a meeting between President Carter and Anwar Sadat at Camp David. Uh, Sadat hated being there. It was winter and it was cold. And he was also very frustrated that nothing had come of his initiative in going to Jerusalem. And I believe, but I have never been able to confirm this, that during the two or three days that President Carter spent with President Sadat at Camp David, mostly alone, although I think the wives were both there, Sadat conveyed to him that he was determined to get an Egyptian-Israeli peace and as much else as he could for the Palestinians, but not at the expense of missing the chance to get the Egyptian-Israeli peace. Because after that meeting, Carter started emphasizing not the comprehensive peace, but getting the return on Sadat's trip to Jerusalem, at least in Egyptian-Israeli peace, and whatever else we could. And that was a shift from our original strategy. So we didn't make any headway on that. Menachem Begin was not prepared to give anything on the Palestinian front. And Sadat was very frustrated because nothing was going his way. So in the summer of 1978, Carter said, no more negotiations at the Secretary of State level. They don't lead anywhere. Decisions can't be made. The only people who can make decisions are Begin and Sadat, and the only person 
might be able to persuade them to move off their known positions is me. I have a good relationship with Sadat, and I, I'm the President of the United States. Begin has to pay attention to me. They didn't have a good personal relationship. So we invited them to come. Sadat agreed enthusiastically because he thought that he and President Carter were more or less on the same wavelength and that they could jointly put pressure on Begin for concessions. Begin was suspicious. He suspected that there was something between Sadat and Carter, and he was right up to a point. But he couldn't say no, so he came. So we had about a month to prepare in detail, and the whole State Department NSC operation kicked into high gear, and we produced a briefing book of about 150 pages. Carter actually read these briefing books, unlike some presidents. Um, and we put a lot of effort into a topic called, what we called the pivotal issue, it was called the linkage issue. How much more than an Egyptian-Israeli peace could we get? In other words, would the Egyptian-Israeli peace be dependent on at least some step on the Palestinian front? We call that linkage. And we thought that was the issue, because Sadat wanted some, and Begin didn't want any. So that was gonna be hard to bridge the gap. And we said, Mr. President, that's your job at Camp David is to get as much linkage as you can. So Carter read this. He met with us two days before Camp David. He said, I've read your briefing book and it stinks. He didn't say it quite that way because he's a polite man, but he said, I don't agree with it. He said, you make it sound much more complicated than it's going to be. We're going to get an Egyptian-Israeli agreement and we're going to get an agreement on how to solve the Palestinian problem and I don't understand this linkage issue at all. Subsequently, I guarantee you he did. But at the time he said, we're just gonna do both of these things. And it's not going to require much from the United States. Again, wrong. He said, they will understand that in coming to this summit, this is a historic opportunity where they both have to be on their best behavior. We will provide the venue, we will sit back and let them play out their historic role of peacemakers. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh, it's Renaissance weekend. It's not serious negotiations. Renaissance weekend for you who are too young to know about this, with this kind of notion that if you just get together and you know, do enjoyable things for a few days, uh, all barriers drop and everybody gets along. And I thought, that is not what is going to happen. Begin and Sadat will not get along. They won't talk to each other. And we've got to have a plan for when that fails. And it failed very, very quickly. But I was anxious about Carter's relatively benign view of what his role would be. It turned out he understood perfectly well after the third day that he was going to have to get deeply involved. And one other thing worried me as we were about to convene. Our ambassador in Cairo, who was very close to Sadat, met him just as Sadat was a well, they were both ready to leave for the United States. And Sadat said, tell your president I have a surprise for him. And I thought, hmm, when Sadat has surprises, they're usually pretty big. And, uh, but he wouldn't tell us what it was in advance, so we couldn't prepare for it. So my sense as we convened is this could turn out any number of ways we could get an Egyptian-Israeli agreement, which I was pretty sure, substantively, we knew what it would look like, and that turned out to be true. And I thought, but how much more than that we can get is what we're going to spend most of our time on. Because Sadat is not a detailed person. He wants something, but he's not going to be in there negotiating the details of it. By contrast, Begin knows exactly what he wants, and he is a perfectionist in terms of words. And he will drive us crazy by saying, well, I can't agree to this, but I could possibly consider that. And that's going to be the real frustration. Uh, because Sadat won't have any patience for that. He'll want us to negotiate <coughs> on his be <coughs> <coughs> behalf over the so-called linkage issues, Palestinian, Jordanian role in future negotiations. So that's how I felt as we arrived. 
So when, when you arrived and the first day, uh, Carter, obviously you, you have the presidents and you have large delegations, high prominent people who, who come in, uh, including yourself and certainly uh, uh, National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski. Um, and Cyrus Vance. And Cyrus Vance and uh, your colleague uh, Harold Saunders, the late Harold Sander Saunders, who's a friend of many of, of ours here. Um, but what happens next is interesting because you have Begin and Sadat have a clash at the start and they have to be separated for the rest of the negotiation. So Carter is bringing them together because he thinks they're the ones who can make a decision and he can sit with them and hammer out an agreement. But very early on, they, they have a clash and then they're, they don't even talk to each other at the very, the very end. So tell us about that. Well, Sadat's surprise, which he hadn't told us about, was that he was going to bring an Egyptian proposal that we had not seen. And it was a fairly long statement of Egyptian policy, a fairly hard statement of it, including comprehensive settlement, Palestinians, everything. And Carter uh, met with Sadat before there was the meeting of Sadat, Begin and Carter. And Sadat said, I'm gonna, I want to introduce this in my meeting with Begin. I want to read this out to him tomorrow. And Carter said, can I look at it first? And he said, I, yes, you can, but I'm going to read it no matter what. This is what I want to do. But I want to tell you, and very few people know this, but this is true. He said, I want to tell you, Mr. President, it's not my real position. I'm doing this to create a crisis with Begin, because he'll go nuts, which he did. And then you will be able to step in and solve the crisis by proposing something in between what I have presented and what Begin will accept, which is, was his way of doing things. He loved these kind of surprises. So the Egyptian document, which in fact he did read to Begin the next day, drove Begin nuts. He could hardly stand it. He started interrupting, and Carter would say, you know, Mr. Prime Minister, let the president finish, and you know, so, so that was terrible. And so Begin said, I demand a right of reply. Tomorrow I want to refute this sentence by sentence, because this is a terrible statement of, you know, we were here to make peace, and this is actually a declaration almost of war. So they went through the second day of Begin refuting everything, and at the end of that day, Ahron Barak, who on the Israeli side was probably the most peace-committed person, he was their attorney general, he really wanted it to work, and he had a very inventive mind. He and Azer Weizmann and actually Dayan were the, the peace camp on Begin's side. He came to me and said, if you want this to succeed, tell your president not to let these two men meet again. They can't stand each other. We, he said, we are in the process of doing our counter draft. And it's going to be terrible. It'll be at least as bad as the Egyptian draft. So just take the Egyptian draft off the table. Don't let us put a draft in. And you guys put a draft forward. Well, by chance, Hal Saunders and I had anticipated that. And we had a draft. So we, they took a break and went to Gettysburg or someplace for a day. And uh, while they were away, we polished up the draft. And it then went through 23 subsequent versions before we finally got the agreement. But they, Sadat and Begin did not talk again until the signing of the peace treaty. They're, they're delegates. I mean, Usama al-Baz and Barak actually worked very closely together on getting the Egyptian-Israeli framework, which was the easy one. And Carter worked very hard on that one. The rest of us worked on the other framework, which was a mess. I mean, it just, we couldn't have a clear statement of anything because every time we tried to say something clearly, Begin would reject it and we would have to find a weasel-worded way of, we should have probably just thrown the whole thing out and say, we can't say anything very specific so just say the minimum that you know, we still want comprehensive peace and Palestinian rights and anybody who wants to negotiate after this is all over, but we didn't. We instead engaged in what lawyers love to do, right? very complicated and totally incomprehensible uh, guidelines for what to do next.
Um, I want to move to uh, Dan Kurtzer for, with a, with a follow-up question, uh, because this is, of course, about Camp David, but it's about Camp David's impact on American foreign policy, and in a way, not just that period, all the way to now. Um, I would like you to think about uh, com comparing for us for a moment uh, something we've done in our common book. There, by the way, for those of you, uh, the three of us here, the men on this panel, happen to be co-authors of a book on, with, we in fact have one other co-author here, Scott Lasinski, who's in the audience, um, uh, on America, called The Peace Puzzle of American uh, Policy Toward the Arab-Israeli Conflict from 1989 on. One of the things we did was compare uh, Camp David I with Camp David II, which was hosted by Bill Clinton, trying to bring the Israelis and the Palestinians together. Um, so for some perspective on, 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 the, on Camp David I, Camp David II can shed some light. And one of the things that I want to ask you to start with about Carter himself uh, versus Clinton. Uh, now, Carter, interestingly, uh, is thought of as not being tough. I mean, his image in, in, you know, around the country is not a tough man. But those of us who studied Camp David very closely um, all have concluded that he was a pretty tough negotiator, that he actually uh, uh, was able to use American leverage very effectively, which is one reason why we had an agreement. An example uh, in the negotiations at Camp David was when he thought Menachem Begin was not forthcoming and not uh, making the concessions, particularly on settlements in the Sinai. Um, he had the team prepare a statement that he would go to the American people to tell them that it was Menachem Begin who uh, was to blame for the failure uh, because uh, he understood that Menachem Begin had to go at least with preserving the U.S.-Israeli relationship even more than he needed an agreement with Sadat. He couldn't afford to have that lost. And he used that against Begin. Uh, with Sadat, he did the same thing. When Sadat packed and gave an indication he was going to leave, uh, he went to his cabin and he said, if you leave today, I'm going to go to the American people and I'm going to say, you are the reason why the negotiations failed. And he got them to stay and to negotiate another day and ultimately had an agreement. Now, how does that contrast both with the, with the, uh, the preparation and the context that took place at Camp David II in 2000 and also Bill Clinton's style of negotiating? Oh, it's a great, <clears throat> it's a great question because we also have an experience in between the two Camp Davids with the administration of George H.W. Bush. And what, the reason to introduce that third element is because both Carter and George H.W. Bush approached a very controversial peace process in their first term, uh, as opposed to Bill Clinton, who had an administration that was pursuing an active peace process throughout, but his personal involvement really became uh, quite demonstrative uh, only perhaps in 1998 with the Y River Accord and then building up to Camp David. Now, I think that's an important uh, distinction uh, among the three uh, because it uh, demonstrates a willingness of a president to go up against American politics uh, and to, in a sense, put uh, the political uh, easiness or ease of dealing with these very controversial issues within the context of American politics, uh, it, it puts it front and center. Uh, Carter, as we know, was a one-term president. George H.W. Bush was a one-term president. I think in neither case can you make the argument that they lost the presidency because of the peace process, but it certainly played a factor in their uh, domestic base uh, in, in both elections as opposed to the Clinton administration, where Clinton, uh, as he gradually uh, enhanced his own uh, involvement, his personal involvement, uh, he ended up doing it uh, within four months or five months of the end of his term. Uh, he was not a lame duck at that point, but he was essentially beyond the point where there would be a tremendous amount of credibility behind American pressures, behind American threats, as you suggest, uh, I'm going to go to the American public and, and uh, make the argument. Uh, it was already uh, a little bit too late. 
demonstrated, in fact, by the fact that uh, Clinton even waited until after the election of George uh, W. Bush to put out the parameters, the Clinton parameters, that maybe in the summer of 2000 might have had a chance of funneling the sides, of channeling their positions in a more uh, positive direction. Uh, what's also interesting, if you look back, and again, comparing now the Carter effort with the George H.W. Bush effort, is the degree to which, I think as Bill indicated, um, there was crisis built in to what became a positive outcome. In the summer of, uh, uh, before the Madrid Peace Conference in 1991, uh, both uh, Yitzhak Shamir, the Israeli Prime Minister, and Hafez al-Assad basically said no to the Bush administration when uh, a proposal was put forward to go to what would become the Madrid Peace Conference. Uh, and in effect, um, what James Baker and Bush did was to replicate somewhat what the American team did in the earlier Camp David experience, was to pick up the pieces and work the issue in a way with the equivalent of the Aharon Baraks and the Osama al -Bazis, different personalities, but working the issue in a way that made it almost impossible for the two leaders and for the Palestinians, in fact, to say no to the ultimate uh, agreement that came forward. Uh, you don't have that same dynamic at, uh, at the second Camp David. Uh, certainly there were crises. Uh, when uh, Clinton went off to uh, Yokohama, I think it was for the, uh, the ASEAN summit, uh, there were crises galore, but you, you didn't have that same um, kind of a dynamism of uh, taking the, the crisis and using that to build the bridges between the two sides on the two core issues at Camp David II, which were Jerusalem and uh, Palestinian uh, rights and refugees. Now, uh, how much, when you, when you do that comparison, and you know, we know there are, uh, people matter, there's, there's Jimmy Carter and there's Bill Clinton. There are advisors in both cases. There's preparation and some lack of preparation at Camp David II for sure. There, there was nothing like the preparation that took place for Camp David I. But how much of that is really mostly that shifted strategic environment? Uh, that is that in, in you know, 1978, this is, we're in the middle of the Cold War, the U.S. wants to win Egypt because it wants an ally in the Arab world in the midst of the Cold War. Uh, you have Egypt, which is the most powerful Arab state. It had fought an effective war against Israel in 73. It had leverage. This is also the pressure of the oil crisis that came right after. So Egypt comes in with substantial leverage. And the U.S. had strategic interests that could, were very well defined. Uh, that the Israeli government couldn't ignore in that, in that game versus at Clinton's time when the Cold War had ended, uh, the Israeli-American relationship was much stronger. The Palestinians had very little leverage. So how much of it is really this strategic transformation? How much of it is the players? Look, I think uh, in some ways the, the vitality and strength of the Camp David experience is diminished somewhat by the uh, international and regional implications. As Carter was focused at Camp David, and Bill would know this better than anyone, there was a, the, the beginning of what was to become the Iranian Revolution. Uh, soon thereafter was Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, the rise of Islamist movements, uh, Hezbollah, the early origins of Hamas, uh, you know, there were, there were major changes in the international and regional environment, which in some ways uh, diminished somewhat the impact of, of Camp David. Because Carter, I mean, I think it's been documented, and if, if I'm wrong, Bill will correct me, uh, Carter was probably not paying as much attention to the events in Iran as uh, a president might have been had he not been so directly focused on the details of uh, working out this critically important agreement. Uh, there were some communications from the region, from our embassies in the region, which were delayed because Carter couldn't focus on them because of what he was doing. 
Uh, so that, that environment certainly uh, uh, it, it, is, it must be taken into account, regional and, and, and international. Uh, by the late 1990s, in the run-up to, uh, to uh, uh, the second Camp David, you had a much different environment. Uh, you were already eight or nine years after the end of the Cold War. Uh, Russia was in a, a period of, uh, of transition and flux. Uh, some of the uh, impact of what America, the U.S. was trying to do in Russia was already beginning to be felt. Um, very different regional and, and strategic environment, which had, camp, had that Camp David taken place a year or two earlier, might have made it easier for President Clinton to both commit the kind of time, effort, backbone, spine that Carter had done uh, without having run out of time in his own administration. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to, to ask to, to, to speed forward to the Trump administration, but I want to keep that till <laughs> a little bit later on in the conversation because I want to, to uh, ask a couple of broader questions starting with Ellen. Um, Ellen, uh, first of all, I know you have uh, thoughts on all of these issues we already talked about, so certainly feel free to, to add to that. But I want to ask you a specific question uh, mostly based on your own experience. Um, you've been in, uh, working in the system as an analyst and in intelligence, particularly on this region, for a long time. And so um, I would like to, you to give us some flavor uh, of the role of analysis inside, both in preparing, we're talking about preparing for Camp David I, preparing for Camp David II, uh, we're, how, how that works within the system, and then also how this agreement have transformed the, the, the kind of analysis that, that is being done uh, uh, or has been done over the years right. since. Well, thanks, Shibley. And it's really a, a pleasure to be part of this panel with people who have such enormous firsthand experience at what is, I hope, indisputably, a great diplomatic achievement for the United States. All things considered, all the bumps in, in the road, et cetera, Camp David is still a diplomatic success story. And it's very useful to consider um, who were the other players on the American team. So I think it's useful to bring in the US military, US intelligence as kind of supporting cast players, if you will, that were able to also open up some other channels, certainly in the implementation phase of these agreements, but even in the preparations and the understanding of what was the terrain or the landscape in which uh, the US diplomats uh, had to operate. So I think we normally think of intelligence as, as sort of looking at the dark side of the human experience, warning of bad things that might happen, telling the diplomats this is going to be very hard, it's probably not going to work. But in truth, the analytic process also, I think, is very uh, content to contribute to diplomatic success and work with diplomats closely to identify opportunities. Sometimes what the analysts can do is pull together the history of uh, in, the personalities of individual players. Um, they can look at some of the supporting information that's necessary. And certainly throughout the long years of diplomacy on Arab-Israeli things, the intelligence community got very, very good at preparing maps, at understanding some of the geographical or economic uh, realities in which some of the diplomatic agreements were, were going, that we're going to address. So I think there was a, a complementarity, but there's also friction. There's also, you know, I think in, it, sometimes the intel folks are pursuing the mission of looking for bad guys or understanding some of the things that are going on in the region that may not be completely um, compatible with how the diplomats are trying to shape the environment. So, you know, we've talked about President Sadat and we haven't mentioned his name, but Yasser Arafat as the interlocutor on efforts to uh, the second Camp David of trying to get um, the Israelis and Palestinians to an agreement. And I think the analytic community could have, you know, probably did contribute in some ways to Sadat was the risk taker. He wasn't as concerned about detail. And Arafat was exceedingly cautious, you know, wanted to avoid. Um, so sometimes the analysts can, can really help the diplomats uh, have some deeper insight but an important point that I want to make is that once these negotiations are really in, in high intensity, the truth is the diplomats become their own analysts. The diplomats will acquire knowledge and understanding of these 
principal players on the other side um, based on long hours of interaction with them. And sometimes the analytic process will a little bit lag behind in its understanding of possibly a shift in the mood between the Israelis and Palestinians, or uh, et cetera. But I do think there, you know, in the, in the big scheme of things, and in a more positive way, um, the analytic community has a lot to contribute while the diplomats are very actively involved in figuring out what are the next steps for the US, the analysts can be looking at other factors in the region that may be watching the domestic politics of Egypt, Israel, Palestine, watching what are other constraints on the actors that we're hoping will be willing to commit themselves to some kind of a, of a political agreement. <clears throat> And then I think that in the years of implementing the Camp David agreements, um, the intelligence channel has proven to be uh, a, a, one of the anchors, if you will, of continuity in the relationship. That even as political actors at the top may change, the presidents depart the scene either through democratic processes or in the tragic case of Sadat by assassination, um, sometimes keeping those channels open with uh, intelligence professionals and military officers uh, does provide some stability in the relationship, even when the politics at the top are very uncertain. Now, um, you know, in addition to the preparation, I mean, one can argue that one of the things that happened after the peace treaty is that the U.S. obviously got closer with Egypt, got closer with Israel, uh, and coordinated in various ways. But a lot of that relationship became a security-based relationship. So in some ways, the intelligence cooperation and the military cooperation became anchors of relationships. So has that not sort of uh, you know, expanded the type of uh, work that the intelligence community yes. is doing? So a good example would be um, the role that George Tennant played in trying to you know, revitalize security cooperation between the Israelis and Palestinians. He turned out to be a trusted persona that both parties were willing to work with, and he became a, a sort of um, surrogate diplomat. And so sometimes the, uh, it can be the intelligence or the U.S. Uh, military that are selected by the White House. In theory, it's all to support the same policy. But as, uh, as you know, you know, career intelligence officers will try to see them, it will try to stick with a protocol that keeps them as apolitical as possible, but they certainly will respond to a tasking that says, really, we need you to go out and actually negotiate with the parties, playing a virtual diplomatic role. So I think you're right that because, you know, some people have said that, you know, security has to come first, others believe that security, economic development, political reconciliation all have to be happening. Uh, in, a, in a sort of dance that happens all at the same time. Uh, but certainly, given the insecurity, that the vulnerabilities that both the Israelis and Palestinians have, have felt over the years of living in such a very small territory together, uh, the security issue looms very large in whether diplomacy will succeed or not. Um, I want to ask about a, a big question that both uh, President Carter and Dr. Sadat mentioned, and that is the question of Palestine. Um, so clearly the, the peace treaty was successful. Uh, Camp David had two uh, framework agreements, uh, followed by a bilateral treaty between Israel and Egypt the following year. And, and that part of the agreement has worked very well in the sense that uh, Egypt and Israel have had a peaceful relationship, not exactly warm peace, uh, perhaps because of the Palestinian issue, but nonetheless uh, a very uh, predictable relationship, stable relationship. It has really kind of survived the ups and downs of politics and the crisis, and, and there hasn't been a major war between them after, again, four major wars in three decades. So in that sense, one can say this has been successful for both countries. Egypt has gotten every, every inch of its territory back peacefully uh, through that agreement. Um, and for the U.S., obviously, it, it was a coup. Uh, it was a coup because it, it reduced the tension in American policy in the Middle East, uh, but it was also a coup against the Soviet Union during the Cold War by winning Egypt over uh, to its side of the equation. 
So in that sense, that's what people talk about success. But you heard uh, Jimmy Carter have expressed regrets about we still, we still don't have uh, uh, a solution to the Palestinian uh, issue. You heard Mrs. Sadat quote President Sadat about no comprehensive peace without a just solution to the Palestinian question. And so the question I want to ask is a little bit bigger than uh, why, do, why haven't we had peace? The question I want to ask is whether the Camp David Accords have made it harder to get peace on the Palestine question because Egypt was the biggest leverage uh, working on behalf of the Palestinians. And so is it really, yes, Sadat envisioned comprehensive peace, and maybe had he survived, he could have pushed for it. Maybe had Jimmy Carter gotten reelected, and maybe you can enlighten us on that uh, bill, uh, he would have pushed for it, which is one reason why Menachem Begin didn't want him to get reelected, and many, and worked hard to make sure he doesn't get reelected to the extent that he could work hard. Um, but that's speculation. So I would, I would like you to, to reflect on this question because, you know, Egypt in the short term had paid a price for the accords. It was expelled from the Arab League. It was isolated. Um, and uh, certainly it got aid from the U.S., but it also lost aid from, from the Arab world. It took it a while to get back uh, uh, with the rest of the Arab world. Um, so what, what do you think about this question, Bill? Well, I, <clears throat> I think once Egypt made peace without any significant gains for the <clears throat> Palestinians, uh, we were in for a long, hard period of no further um, movement on the Palestinian issue. Jordan wasn't going to move on its own. Uh, we haven't talked about the bad relationship between Sadat and Assad, but when Sadat went to Jerusalem in November of in 1977, that was really the end of the relationship with Assad. So Syria wasn't going to be in the peace game for the near future. Jordan wasn't going to be, and the Palestinians weren't going to be. So we were really stuck, and all these efforts at autonomy talks and so forth were really, I think, window dressing. Now, two things might have made a difference. If Begin had been replaced by someone like Yitzhak Rabin in the 1980s, uh, and if Carter had been reelected, or if you had had somebody like George H.W. Bush as president, with Baker as Secretary of State, even with Egypt having made peace, you might have had other reasons for Israelis and Americans to once again pick up the Palestinian, Jordanian, and even Syrian piece of the puzzle which eventually they did in the 1990s, but you wouldn't have necessarily lost the decade of the 1980s. But Reagan had no intention of building on Camp David because that was Jimmy Carter's success. Uh, his own Reagan plan specifically says no Palestinian state. It also says no Israeli settlements and no annexation. But the thing that people remember is Reagan said no Palestinian state. Although ironically, he was the president who did recognize the PLO and start a dialogue with them. So we lost a lot of time, and because Egypt was at peace, as long as Begin and his successors were in power or were the dominant influence over foreign policy and Israeli politics, you weren't going to have any movement toward the Palestinians. But also, people forget this. It wasn't just that the Likudniks hated the idea of a Palestinian state hated the PLO. They didn't like Jordan either. They didn't want Jordan to take the West Bank back. And that was the difference with Labour Party leaders would have been prepared to talk with Jordan and eventually with Palestinians. Uh, but I think we have to come to a conclusion that from the moment that Begin tipped the political balance in Israel toward the right wing toward Likud, there has been no chance of a significant breakthrough on the Palestinian front unless there was an American president with the capacity to significantly pressure 
a Likud leader for change, and we have never had that. Now that tells something about our leaders and our political system. You wouldn't think that it would be impossible for a country that uh, gives Israel $3 billion and has over the years, and now probably much more than that, and all kinds of things, to use some of that to get at least something. But it's remarkable how president after president after president has been unable to fundamentally get concessions on these core issues, which are territory, borders, Jerusalem. You could say that Clinton at least gave an outline of what needed to be done, but the striking thing to me about Clinton is he had no strategy for making it happen. It was just words, and he actually told the parties, if you don't accept it, it's off the table. Terrible thing to say, because for the people who don't want to accept it anyway, just wait. First he'll be gone, and then the, the whole proposal will disappear. So I think we have misplayed whatever cards we had, but the cards were never going to be very useful in a game that was sort of stacked against any president who wanted to stand up against a hardline Israeli uh, prime minister. And unfortunately, there have been a lot of them, including today. So, yeah, I, I want to actually, I want you both to, to, to comment on this, but I, I want to also be very specific uh, because I think, uh, you know, we're talking in generalities here about this question. But at Camp David 1, uh, there were two specific issues related to the likelihood of implementing the agreement on the Palestinian question. One was a settlement freeze, and the other was linkage between the two agreements, whether there would be any kind of linkage. Because obviously one of the reasons why you could implement the Egyptian-Israeli agreement fully uh, without implementing the Palestinian Israeli uh, the, the agreement on Palestinian autonomy was there was no linkage, completely no linkage. Uh, but on settlements, uh, obviously Carter thought he had a deal. He, he talked about it in terms of what uh, the deal was with Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin always argued that uh, Carter, he never gave Carter the assurance or he interpreted differently uh, in terms of the length of uh, the settlement, the, the settlement freeze that uh, would be initiated for the duration of what talks. Um, now, obviously, one reason why we're very far from having an agreement on the Palestinian question is that settlements have expanded tremendously since that period. So obviously, there was no settlement freeze. Uh, when Harold Saunders went to sell the agreement uh, to the Arab world, he came back with a conclusion that those two issues, the settlement freeze and linkage, could have enabled him to sell it to the Arab world, but the absence of that made it harder for him to sell it to the Arab world. So, the, the, so the, I'm not sure whether it was, would have, if, if Bill is right, uh, uh, it, Menachem Begin would never have given in on these issues. That was just not going to be in the bag. Is, I, you, you, you won't, you just won't, a, yeah. short, before, sure. go ahead. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that's, you, you don't agree with that, or you agree with that? We never, I wasn't in the meeting where Carter thought he got the commitment on the settlement freeze, but I was right outside the door and I got debriefed on it very quickly. And Vance came out and said, we don't know for sure, but we think we can get uh, Israel to agree to um, a settlement freeze for a number of months, but we need to pin it down tomorrow. It was clear to me that we didn't have it. Carter thought that he had been asking for a settlement freeze for up to a year or so. And I think that Begin had said to him in their private meeting, I will give you my answer tomorrow. And I think Carter heard that as I will give you the answer you want tomorrow. But when we got it tomorrow, it wasn't that. And I think in Begin's mind, we were saying to him that either you give us a settlement freeze that could be indefinite because it was linked to the onset of Palestinian Israeli negotiations. And the Palestinians hadn't agreed to negotiate at that point. They might not have, or they might have been procedural obstacles, or who knows what reasons there might have been. And in Begin's mind, if it's linked to a negotiation with the Palestinians that I don't, I don't even want, but may never happen, this could mean I'm committed forever. So he gave us a three-month commitment. He said, I'll give you a commitment on a freeze on settlements as long as we're negotiating with Egypt on the peace treaty. What we didn't do at that point is go back to him and said, three months isn't good enough. 
We understand that forever is a long time, and we have to put a time limit on this, but we want a one-year commitment from you, tied to a serious attempt to get negotiations started with Jordan. We did not do that. Had we done it before the signing of the Camp David Accords, I'm not sure that Begin could have said no. But that's the one thing we never tried, because we thought, and this was Carter's misreading of Begin, he thought he had his agreement before he got it on paper. When he saw it on paper, he said, that's not what you agreed to. Begin said, well, and he was asked to give us another letter. The next day, after the signing of the Camp David Accords, he sent us the same letter. And there was a very brief moment when Carter and Vance, and Brzezinski and I and others said, can we do anything about this? We've just signed this. Can we withhold our agreement to finance you know, the removal of the air bases in, in Sinai, which was going to cost, what, $3 billion or something like that? Uh, can we explain that the signature was conditionally in our mind on this understanding? Everything has to be put on hold. And I think in Carter's mind, the answer was no. Nothing changes for the next three months in any case. The priority is the Egyptian-Israeli peace, which is now in some jeopardy because of other developments in the region, including Iran. And just let it lie for now. We'll get back to it later. And of course, we never did. Uh, yeah, both of you. I, I'd like to. Up, yes, I, yeah. Directly on, on that point, for any student of diplomacy who thinks that diplomatic ambiguity in language is a good idea, <laughs> the settlements issue is a perfect case study. Because you have what Bill just indicated. You had the same kind of ambiguity between uh, George H.W. Bush and Shamir. Bush, in the first meeting with Shamir, said to him, I hope we're not going to have a problem about settlements. And Shamir said, of course we're not going to have a problem. <laughs> and you know where that went. But Shamir is We're saying, have a problem. <laughs> I'm building settlements, that's not a problem. We had the problem with the Oslo Accords, where uh, uh, we now know that the Palestinians wanted a settlements something in it, and Rabin uh, basically told his negotiators, convey to them the idea that I don't want to pay the domestic political price for freezing settlements, but I'm going to constrain it. Well, settlements grew exponentially during... The, that, that decade. Uh, and then you had the uh, so-called settlements freeze of the uh, Obama administration, which was not really a freeze at all. It was a freeze on new starts, but when the Israelis knew that they, they were going to have to do a freeze on new starts, they started a lot of settlement activity so that for the 10 months of the freeze, there was no diminution in any activity related to settlements. And this relates specifically to these two issues. One is ambiguity, and the other is presidential backbone when it comes to actually holding the parties accountable. Monitoring, accountability, and consequences have never been a major part of American diplomacy, and that's been one of the, the significant problems that we've faced. So I want to take a different tack, if I might, uh, which is to go back to your what I thought was your question, after Egypt, who was going to be the champion for the Palestinians? And, sort of some of the shifts in Arab world politics as a consequence of Camp David. We think of Camp David as, you know, sort of the, the upside of Egypt and Israel normalizing relations, but the truth is Egypt was punished for Camp David. There was enormous isolation, big disruption in the Arab, in Arab world power politics. Um, Egypt was taken out of the equation as the natural leader of Arab world politics, and fairly quickly, by 82 at the summit in Rabat, we had the FAD plan, we then, the, so the Saudis and the Gulf emerges over time as uh, more of the champion for the Palestinians. And so I, I think we have to also acknowledge that in the inner circle that the US had a lot of engagement with, that's not where the action was on the Palestinians. Egyptian foreign policy further contracted, I would say, or declined in that decade of, of relative isolation uh, regionally. Um, and uh, so it was a problem that there wasn't a, a champion that was close to the United States really uh, defending Palestinian rights and interests. Uh, and I think that in that period, while some in Congress and in American politics realized that this was 
uh, a, a sort of long-term problem, and that, there is, that even if you looked at it through the prism of Israeli security, there were people who understood that uh, doing more for the Palestinian side was actually an investment in security for all in the region, not just the rights of the Palestinians. But that removal of Egypt from Arab diplomacy, I think we should not neglect. I think that really did have consequences. Yeah, and uh, so uh, yeah, another yeah, comment. Yeah. I had one other point uh, in terms of the implications of the second half of the Camp David Accords. You know, Bill suggested earlier it might have been better just to have a one sentence outcome saying there should be a comprehensive settlement. You know, one of the, the uh, as Bill was leaving government, I was arriving in Cairo, and I was part of the U.S. delegation to the autonomy talks, Palestinian autonomy talks, and this became a burden on American policy for the next more than 13 years, because you can see a straight line between the elements of the autonomy framework that was being negotiated in the early 1980s and what emerges both in uh, the Washington negotiations after Madrid and then in the Oslo Accord. You don't have a, an agreement, a conceptual agreement, on the idea of a two-state solution until much later, until the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, Sharon, I think, was the first Israeli prime minister to articulate the idea that there could be a Palestinian state. Rabin, in fact, uh, had made public his opposition to a Palestinian state. So that, that second half of Camp David, which was used at the time in order to, uh, in a sense, provide a sop to the Palestinians, ended up being a, a real drag on American policy for quite some time and uh, set us back. Uh, even if we had not had a president willing to do the right thing, we also didn't have a policy that would allow any president to kind of move forward boldly into the idea of a two-state solution. Well, I want to ask uh, all three of you a final question, and that is about the current administration. Um, and I'm not really going to ask you to try to analyze our president. I think that that's hopeless. Oh, come so, on. Uh, come on. Uh, I, instead, I'd like you to just reflect on sort of what is taking place in effect um, as, as, a, as a behavior on this issue. I don't want to call it a policy. Um, uh, and think about what President Carter said in his uh, message to us, uh, that uh, we need to have a, an honest broker who is credible to all parties to be successful in mediation. And he added that he doesn't think what we now have is the U.S. playing a role of an honest broker? So let's start with that. How would you characterize what we're now doing? Uh, what is, I shouldn't say we, in, in some way, we're implicating all of us in, in what is being done in our name, but uh, what, what is being done by the team um, uh, that is advising the president uh, on, on, the, uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian issue? Bill, wanna, I'll start with you and then I'll go to to Ellen and, and uh, Dan for final remarks. And you said we're not supposed to say rude things about the president? <laughs> uh, feel free, I just didn't want to open that myself. I think when you start talking about the remaining parts of the Arab-Israeli conflict as a deal of the century to be made by the world's greatest real estate negotiator, you're in for trouble. This is not a real estate transaction. Real estate's involved, but this is also about national interests, about security concerns, about highly symbolic issues, Jerusalem, about people's rights. And to make it all sound like I'm a great negotiator, I just have to find you know, the, the knobs to turn to get this done, and I'll put these world-class negotiators happen to be my real estate lawyer, who happens to be very well connected to the Israelis and to the settlers, my son-in-law, who knows presumably very little about the Middle East, but who brags about, I don't need to read books about the Middle East because everything that preceded me has failed. So why learn from failures? And I can't even remember who else is supposed to be part of the team. Uh, or that advises Trump, this cannot work. Or if it works, it will be because someone else has completely circumvented this network of 
people who have, at least in my mind, very little credibility for negotiating very complicated issues of this sort. At best, they may come out with a statement. We've seen previews of what it will include. It is inconceivable to me that Palestinians, or frankly, any other Arabs, <clears throat> would embrace what's being put on offer. Now, maybe behind closed doors, and I suspect this is happening, you know, Saudis of a certain persuasion and perhaps some people from elsewhere in the Gulf are telling the Trump administration, we don't really care about the Palestinian issue any longer, just go through the motions. Um, maybe, you know, our king will not say nice words, but believe me, those of us who are your best friends in the Gulf uh, are on your side. We're fed up with this whole issue. Forget about it. What matters to us is only one thing, and that's Iran. You support us on Iran, we will stab the Palestinians in the back, to put it not too politely. And I think the American administration is perfectly happy with that. Because if they put their proposal out, and it gets rejected by the Palestinians, but the other Arabs don't react very much, they'll say, well, look where the problem is. The problem is the Palestinians, which is what we've been telling you all along. They need new leadership. They need a change of mindset. They need to redefine their status. They're not really refugees. They're just somebody else now. So people claim there are too many refugees. We'll solve the problem by reducing the numbers. I mean, the whole rhetoric surrounding this is crazy. And if it works, um, fortunately, I'm no longer in the business of advising or teaching or anything else. I can just sort of go take up French poetry or something else with the rest of my life. But when I was actively involved and things like this came up, I would tell my students that if invading Iraq really solves all of our problems in the Middle East and one, two, three, four, all the bad regimes get replaced by liberal democracies and we have Arab-Israeli peace, I am going to get out of this profession because it will mean I know nothing about the Middle East. But I hope that the people who took us into the Iraq war or were taking us into this Israeli-Palestinian dead-end peace policy will have the good sense when it fails to also say, sorry, I didn't understand what was going on, and I will now stop messing around with a region that I don't understand. And you can't make peace in the Middle East based on total ignorance. And that's what they're trying to do. Ellen. So, unfortunately, I think the decline of American influence in the Middle East actually predates the Trump administration. But I think the Trump administration's efforts are, are, are quite bizarre and almost laughable. I mean, the impression one has is that they've delayed, delayed, because they're slowly learning that this is really complicated. Uh, but they might, in fact, try to present a plan which is essentially the status quo that they will call a great breakthrough. Uh, the Israelis will like it, the Palestinians won't, and it will be dead on arrival. But to me, that having a, a pseudo-diplomatic initiative pretending in the Trump world that it's a success, when in fact it's, it doesn't advance anybody's interests, it just uh, embraces what the current Israeli government believes is, the, you know, is making a virtue of the status quo, uh, I think that only exacerbates the decline of American influence in the region. So I, I think we're at a very uncomfortable and even tragic moment for uh, the loss of the United States' ability to set the agenda. Let's not forget Syria. Let's not forget that there's other awful things happening in the region beyond Israel-Palestine that in which the United States also has not been a, a very effective player of late. So I would prefer to put this in a, bigger, in a bigger box that the poor Palestinians are victims, but they're not the only victims in the region right now. It's not all America's fault, for sure, but I don't see us as bringing much in the solution category uh, to the table. Well, yeah. First, I, I agree with uh, everything that's been said on this, but I'll add one dimension, which is, I think there's a... <laughs> Time's up. I think there's a distinction to be drawn between 
what President Trump thinks he's doing and what his advisors think they're doing. Uh, it's not unusual for presidents to say something without having thought it through. We've seen previous administrations, previous presidents, articulate a thought, Assad must go, without really having an intention to follow through. So when Trump tells the Wall Street Journal, I'm going to make the ultimate deal of the century, he doesn't have a clue what he's talking about, doesn't have an idea about whether or not it's the right time to do it, whether or not it's the right circumstances, whether or not uh, he has the wherewithal to do it. You then have the, the team that he's put together, as Bill suggested, is very much associated with a, a political orientation in Israel, right-wing political orientation in Israel. And I think that team has developed a concept that uh, around which they can wrap this idea that they're presenting the ultimate deal. And that concept is to align our interests in the Middle East entirely with those of the State of Israel. Now, we've had a, a very strong and positive strategic relationship with Israel for a long time. It's one of the consequences, in fact, of uh, the first Camp David Accords that we had strategic cooperation beginning in the 1980s. But we've always had differences of view with Israel on a number of issues. We have found ways to mediate some of those differences. We found ways not to mediate some of those differences. And I don't think now there's any, any distance between uh, the views of the, the team that's putting this together. It's uh, Kushner, Greenblatt, and Friedman in Israel, uh, and Israel, uh, and the Israeli government. In fact, I think that a fourth member of that team might be the Israeli ambassador in Washington, who has been a very close advisor and confidant to this group. So the strategic issues here, which Trump has no, has no clue about what he's gotten himself into, are much larger than whether or not they put forward a plan that gets rejected. Of course this plan is going to get rejected. They've made sure of that by uh, the ham-handed way in which they handled the Jerusalem issue and now the ham-handed way in which they're uh, handling the Palestinian refugee question through UNRWA and cutting off aid. So there's no question that whatever they put forward is, is literally dead on arrival. But I think there's a much larger strategic picture involved here. Not that I ascribe such brilliance to them to think that they thought of the strategy, but I think they've gotten themselves into this strategy, which plays into what Ellen said as well, which effectively is, we don't think for ourselves, and we're not acting for ourselves in this region. And now this group has come along and said, well, the Israelis know better what's good for us. Pull us out of the Iran Accord. Uh, uh, you know, encourage Assad to uh, recover uh, the rest of Syria, and, and, and. And I think that's what the danger uh, really lies. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm going to give you my own reflection on this because I, um, uh, you know, I... I Obviously, we all are pondering this, uh, uh, you know, what is this moment for U.S. policy in the Middle East? Um, and just the good starting point is, Trump aside, uh, we have failed uh, as, as a country, uh, uh, including in the Obama administration. Uh, I mean, there was a genuine effort, the president that came, uh, some of us have, have worked with that administration closely. We also have a, a distinguished special envoy uh, Martin Indyk sitting here in, in the front who, who worked on this day in and, and day out, uh, and, and the efforts failed, and they failed principally because this was not a priority issue for a president of the United States of America. Uh, it has not, because it takes, uh, you, have, you can't negotiate a deal on this issue uh, without paying a price, and, and it, is, it has to be an important issue. This has not been a priority issue. And it hasn't been a priority issue for a lot of reasons that are strategic over the past uh, couple of decades. Uh, uh, the Arab world is weakened uh, by the Arab uprisings, by divisions, by the rise of other threats. The Israeli-American relationship is much stronger than it ever was at every level. Israel is far more dominant militarily uh, the Palestinians are more alone than they have ever been, at least with regard to Arab governments. Um, and so we, it takes a lot of effort to be able to succeed, and it has not been a priority issue for any administration, including the Obama administration, which sounded like it really was a priority, but in the end was not 
uh, president was not prepared to make hard decisions to move it forward. And it's not about the advisor, it's not about the, ultimately it is, like with Carter and everybody else, that's what it takes. In this particular administration, it was kind of surprising that we had a president who said, when everybody said, you can't do it, to say he was going to do it. And there are lots of reasons why he said that, maybe because he thinks he could do anything, uh, and that was part of the story. But part of the story may be, in fact, his advisors, the trio who cl clearly care about this issue from their own ideological point of view, who, have, who are unprecedentedly inexperienced. We have never had, talking about experience, we've never had people with that little experience in mediation on the region, fully in charge of making policy and marginalizing every other part of the government, the State Department, the intelligence community, and the president, of course, we read the stories about him. He's essentially providing them the cover to unleash what they want. And I think what is happening, you can look at it as a brute exercise of power uh, of, uh, that, that the U.S. And, and Israel and maybe some allies have a lot of power to work together uh, to, to achieve a different order. Uh, the way I see it, in, in my own view, I think that uh, it is in a way that they see all these other issues like the UNRWA or the UN resolutions or uh, the Jerusalem issues as having been obstacles in an inevitable course where Israel would reap the benefit of its historic win uh, in the struggle with the Palestinians, about winning and losing. And now they're clearing the deck. They're moving all the pieces aside for Israel to be able to be able to implement, to reap the benefit of a historic win. I don't think there is a historic win. Uh, I think Israel has the upper hand, but if Israel were capable on its own of implementing a solution that is durable, it would have done it a long time ago. It would not have waited for Trump administration. And in the end, I'm with Bill, and I think with everybody else on this, that this is not gonna work. And unfortunately, Bill, uh, the people who are taken us to that path that is going to be a dead-end path that is not going to be for the region, it's not going to be for Israel, good for Israel, it's not going to be good for the Palestinians, it's not going to be good for the Arabs, it's not going to be good for America. The people who are taking us on that path, like we were taken on the path to the Iraq war, when all of us warned it was going to lead to a dead end that is going to be detrimental to everyone else, the most biggest disaster that we have faced in American foreign policy in the past several decades in terms of consequences, we're gonna face that dead end, and the people who will have taken us there will never admit it, unfortunately. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and please join us for reception afterwards. <laughs>